audio at the beginning. But now there's audio. Audio, audio. I know. And now I'm not echoing. All right. So, hey, sorry if you're watching from home. We talked about a whole bunch of stuff. It was really important. I'm sorry you missed it. Um, <laughs> where was it? What was I saying? Uh, we started the class. We talked about this process of going from art to part and the steps you have to take. The We as, as manufacturing engineers, as the... Um, the programmers, the manufacturing engineers, the setup people, people that run the machines, the stuff that we get to pick, those things are called the process variables. The stuff that we don't get to pick, we don't get to pick which material the part's going to, what material the part's going to be made out of. We don't get to pick the size and shape of the features on the part, right? That's all the designer guy's job, right? The designer has to pick all that stuff. And, um, as uh, as young engineers, most of I think you're all younger than me at least, right? So as young engineers, you're often going to be put in place where you're going to be designing stuff that later gets manufactured. In fact, if you want to design stuff that's never going to get manufactured, I don't know. That's pretty lame. So you're going to be designing stuff that's going to get manufactured. It's really good for you to understand how that manufacturing happens in the in the parts of it so that you do better design. And it's also really good for you to understand that you have to convey that knowledge to the people. You have to convey the knowledge of exactly what the design does to the people that are doing the work. But anyway, today we're going to be the manufacturing engineers, not the designers. Today we're going to be talking about picking those process variables, the things that we get to choose in order to make the parts come out to be what the designer asked for. And we've talked about quality. We've talked about the fact that we have to make measurements and do stuff at the end to make sure that we did make the part that they want. But now we're going to talk about the stuff about making the part. So in CNC machining, since that's our focus in the class, in CNC machining, what are the process variables that you already know of? What are the things that you get to control as the manufacturer that in, influence how the part comes out? Yeah. CNC. All right, so we've got feed. And so in a turning operation, that's how fast that cutting tool is moving sideways through the workpiece. In a milling operation, it's how fast that, that cutting tool is moving sideways through the workpiece or up and down through the workpiece, right? So it's, it's sort of that, when you look at it in the Cartesian coordinate system, it's how fast is it moving sideways? What else? Yep. Depth of cut. I'm gonna say DOC, depth of cut. In turning, it's how far. So if we do a, a quick example here. Right, so we've got our, our turning. So our 2D representation of turning, we've got our turning tool right here, and it's feeding in this direction, right? So it's feeding sideways like that. This then is the depth of cut. Is how far in? Now we also have two diameters here, right? We have a D. Let's call it F for finished or final, and a D. I don't know. Oh, for original. What's the difference between DO and DF? Yeah. Is it the depth of cut? It is the depth of cut times two. So D, what I call it, DO minus DF equals DOC times two, because it's spinning around, right? We take it off both sides. We only represent it on one side, but we take it off both sides. All right, so we get to choose the feed. I'm forgetting to write that feed. We get to choose the feed and the depth of cut. What else do we get to choose? We get to choose more than that. The, 
the spindle speed. So V depth of cut speed. And in machining in general, if we just say speed, we mean something very specific. We mean the speed that the chip is moving past the cutting tool. We mean, so we mean that speed of the chip sliding across the cutting tool. If we, if we sort of zoom in on that, oh shoot. Can anybody draw an eyeball? You can draw an eyeball? Yes. Yeah, draw me an eyeball right here so that it's looking down the cutting edge of the tool. Which way? So, so if I'm, like if I got down here, oh. and I'm looking down the cutting edge of the tool. So if we're looking down the cutting edge of the tool like that, I can't draw eyeballs. I have tried to do this before. We'll see if he can. Beautiful. All right, so you've all got this pictured. Well, we're looking straight down the cutting edge of the tool. And we zoom in, we see this. So, And so this is work beast. This is chip. This is tool. So the speed that we're talking about is that direction, is the speed of the tool moving through the workpiece in that direction. In this picture, what is that then? So I want to know, we'll call it S for speed. Sometimes we use a V there for velocity. This is the velocity of the workpiece relative to the tool as it slides by. If we look in this picture, what is it? Because that's the speed that we talk about when we say the word speed with regard to CNC machining. Anybody know? So if you, if you think of it, that motion is happening because the workpiece is rotating. How this, this dimension right here, which we call T1, which is our uncut thickness, that T1 is happening because as it rotated one revolution, we went some distance in this direction because of the feed. Right? Go ahead. Is this the first board? Yeah. That's no. That's so yeah, that's why I was just making sure. Uh, on, let's fix that. There, well, that's the first board. Yeah. <laughs> now we have a common frame of reference. This is an idealized turning operation. This is the same operation, but looking straight down the cutting edge of the tool. Different view, same exact operation, different view, different perspective. So as we do that, so the reason this chip forms and it moves off this way and it curls up and you've all seen them in the lathes, right? And these long stringy chips and they wrap around stuff and sometimes they spin around stuff. The reason that happens is because of the rotations. This dimension is because of the moving sideways as we, as we rotate the thing. So that speed, it's speed, the, the full name is, surface speed but if we just say speed we mean surface speed depth of cut is how far the tip is relative to the outside of the part in this in this example in a milling exam in a milling machine depth of cut actually has two dimensions it's how far down you are in the part and how far sideways you are into the part. But in turn, since turning has one fewer axis, when we talk about a lot of this, we like to use turning as our example, 
the physics that are happening here are identical in turning and milling. It's the same cutting edge interaction. Yeah. I gotta say, those chips that come out of it, um, they look mighty equally challenging. Yep, yeah, we totally recycle those chips. Um, all right, workpiece, tool, chip. All right, so speed. And we, as good American machinists, hard-working American machinists, the units for speed are, of course, feet per minute. Because why wouldn't you use feet per minute? <laughs> the, the rest of the world uses meters per minute. We use feet per minute. Um, just, to, just to keep it exciting. So if you want, and, but, but who, who's the one that said speed? I forget. Somebody, somebody prompted me to put speed on the board. And I think that person said the spindle speed or the speed the spindle was rotating, right? Right? So that's definitely related to speed. And when I want to talk about that, I will say specifically spindle speed. So if I say spindle speed, I'm talking about units of revolutions per minute, RPM. Yeah. So when you're talking about surface speed, are you taking into account the velocity of the, the work piece moving with you? And In most instances, we neglect that. We, it's there, right? There is a component, and it changes the direction of the vector just a little bit. But we pretty, it's the difference between how much comes from the rotation and how much comes from the feeding sideways is almost always negligible on, on the feeding sideways part of it. Yeah. So we um, do also calculate the um, circumference of the... Um... 100%. You have to calculate the circumference in order to figure out how to go from RPM to SFM. Yeah. That makes sense to everybody? Intuitively, now we get it? Yeah. I could just tell you the equation. In fact, there's a slide. Let me... It's a hammer drill. Oh, sounds like a hammer drill. Let's see. Um, what are the PVs? Yeah, where's my... What, what was I going to find a slide of? Oh, yeah, okay. It's got to be here. Yeah. So I could just tell you an equation. Um, and this is a common equation. So how do we go from what we know about the geometry and the physics to that equation? What does 4 equal? Does it, it doesn't really make sense, does it? It's the equation people typically use. What is 4 equal? Anybody know? I know because I've done the lecture before. Yeah. 4 equals 12 divided by pi. Because our diameter is almost always given to us in inches. Our surface speed is, is always in feet. That is the unit for surface speed. Um, I prefer not to use 4. I prefer to use 12 divided by pi. It gets me a more accurate answer. On the other hand, on the shop floor, doing the math, and, and the reason this formula came up was because people were doing this math, standing in front of the manual machine tool, holding the two handles, figuring out where to set the spindle, and they didn't have uh, infinite variability in spindle speed. They had different spindle speeds that they could check by setting gears in different places in their gearbox, so you only needed to be close. To the right spindle speed. Yeah. I know RPM, but what does SFM stand for? Surface feet per minute. Oh. And, and so we'll, we'll talk about SFM um, and we'll talk about RPM quite a bit in conversationally when we talk about it. When you're doing math, remember that SFM is feet divided by minutes and RPM is revolutions divided by minutes, right? Or, yeah. RPM, didn't want to misspeak, and that the circumference of the part is 
typically, you can, you could make it be feet, but typically it's inches per revolution. It's how far did that point on the part move in each revolution? Because my second favorite haiku, engineering's math, just a bunch of word problems, cancel the units. If you forget that circumference is inches per revolution, you'll have a hard time canceling the units when you do this conversion. You got a hand up? Yeah, I was going to ask, what is the, you know how you always use rapid 25%? Yeah. No. No. So in the in the machine tools, there's there's actually three different ways that a machine tool moves. It's not X Y Z. Although people always want that, I always ask that question. What what are the three ways a machine tool moves? And people are like X Y Z. Well, that's true also. Uh, but what happens is there's three movement commands. There's a rapid command, and the G code for that is G zero zero, like the first one. And when we're moving in rapid, we just want the tool to move from wherever the hell it is to the spot we wanted it to be as quickly as the machine can get it there. So it's not doing an operation. And we don't usually intend to use a rapid command when we're engaging with the material. So we use rapid to move from the tool change location to where the part is, um, from one part of the operation to another part of the operation. And, uh, and it does not necessarily move in a straight line. It moves as fast as it can, um, which on, on the Haas machines that we have, it's actually kind of interesting. It's called a dog leg rapid. And so if you're, if we just look at X and Y here, and if you happen to be here and you wanted to move to here, that's your target location. What it would do is it would start the x-axis and the y-axis servo motor as fast as it can go. And it will go in a straight line, 45 degree angle on the, on the table. And it's going to monitor the position in x and y the whole time. And when it says, oh, well, I have reached, I have reached the y direction that I want, it stops that axis and then moves in a straight line across here. It stops when it gets to the X point. So it's easier to do that and do the calculations to figure See, out. See, yeah. It's, it's faster for the computer to process this than it is to process the other one. Um, in a feed move, which is, is, you don't have to memorize the G codes. There's some of them that you see all the time that you're going to remember. Is what feed move is a G01. This is a G00. A feed move from here to here will go in a straight line if it's a G01. If it's a G02, it will go in a clockwise arc. And if it's a G03, it'll go in a counterclockwise arc. And when you do the arc, it's a constant radius arc. Um, you have to, so in all of them, you have to tell it where's the endpoint we want to go to. In the G01, 2, and 3, you also have to tell it at what rate. That's where you put in the feed rate in that command. Um, but we're actually taking a step back from that. Um, it, you do you do pick those things, but I wanted to look sort of at this level what's happening. All right, so so you got this pi times diameter. That's our circumference, right? And that's in inches per revolution. And we've got a change from inches to feet, so we get a twelve in there, and that's how we get this equation. Okay, so. This is, an, oh, and, and so this is an o representation of an outside diameter or an OD turning operation. We're moving material from the outside diameter of the part. It's the same thing if we paste, if we have the tool on the inside of the part that's removing diameter on the inside, right? I mean, the signs are opposite, but it's the same process. When we cut material off the end of the part, so if the tool's going to move, and maybe we change the orientation of the tool, Eraser. If we change the orientation of that tool, and all of a sudden we're moving across the face of the part, well, first we only have to go to the center, right? Because it's spinning around. So we will remove all of the material off the face of the part 
by the time we got to the center. That makes sense? When we feed in this direction, because the feed could be that direction also, what happens to the surface speed as we get to the center? First off, the surface speed here, you can calculate, you know this diameter, right? And so you can calculate the surface speed if you know what the RPM is, right? So let's say we're going 1,000 RPM. Yep. Decrease. It decreases. What is the surface speed when diameter equals zero? <laughs> zero, right? Because if diameter equals zero, surface speed has to equal zero. Uh, if you wanted to, in, in our lathe, and when you were running the lathe, did you ever notice that the pitch of the spindle motor changed over time? And so as it gets closer to the center, we have a feature turned on that's called constant surface speed. Because the tooling manufacturer, they want us to keep that surface speed constant. The cutting operation wants that surface speed to be constant. And so as you feed towards the center, you increase the RPM. You can keep that surface speed constant. Unfortunately, we do not have the infinite speed option on our lathe. <laughs> and not only that, think about the physics, especially on the three jaw chuck on the lathe. So we've got our, I got one more board. There is a third board. So if you were looking at end on and you've got your part here and you've got your jaw clamping it and your jaw clamping it and your jaw clamping it, right? What keeps the part from moving in and out of the lathe? So it's cutting force that pushes on it. It's trying to push it into the lathe. Yep. Friction here, right? So friction there keeps the part from moving in and out of the lathe. There's other stuff that keeps it from bending up and down and stuff, right? What's the friction depend on? Yeah. So the force available from friction is N normal force times mu. So friction coefficient. The normal force is supplied by a hydraulic pump. We push hydraulic fluid up against those things. It clamps it together. That supplies a constant pressure. But as soon as we start spinning it, what happens to the jaws? Uh, I doubt it. Maybe there is some contribution, but I doubt that happens. Send Tripital force or centrifugal acceleration, right? These jaws, as soon as you start rotating, all want to go that way. The faster you go and the heavier they are, because that depends on the, the rotational velocity and the mass of the jaw, the faster you go and the uh, heavier they are, the more they want to go away, which makes your normal force go down. So the faster you spin the spindle, the less clamping force you have. And we see it all the time. It, it, so you can adjust, there's a little knob on the side of the lathe, you can adjust how much clamping force you have. We see it all the time that somebody has cut some delicate material, they've turned down the clamping force. The next person goes to rough out their big steel part and it's not the shape they expected because the part moved in the spindle. The other thing it does is it rotates the spindle. It'll stall in the spindle. Um, if you do that fast enough, you can weld the part to the jaw with stir welding, which is also a bad thing. Um, so there's lots of ways that we can screw up parameters. Oh, so we just got another parameter, right? We can set the clamping force on the lathe. Right, that's, that's kind of an important parameter in a turning operation. We also set the clamping force in the mill when we use the mechanical advantage on the lever arm, right? On the on the Y block we had you guys use the torque wrenches. Turns out if you have the wrong parallels, it doesn't help. <laughs> but um, so those are
parameters that we get to choose. So we, what do we got so far? Feed speed, depth of cut? Which one's the most important? It's a trick question. There's not really a most important in them. I would say that we care less about the color of the machine tool, but it's a factor, right? We care less about where in the shop you put the machine tool down, but it's a factor. In some cases, it's a critical factor. So if you put it on a floor that's not very stable, you're gonna get extra vibrations in the machine tool. You're gonna have a harder time holding the tolerance to a finer, finer number. Um, if you put it right next to a window, and the sun shines, and it's in maybe the east side of the building, all morning the sun shines on it, then the sun goes up here and stops shining on it, then the sun comes over here and it's not shining on it. So different times of the day, there's different temperature acting on the machine. We already talked about the fact that they grow and shrink, right? I, I had a machine that I told you it would grow a, a thousandth of an inch over a seven hour period and then it would stay stable. So, and that was the spindle. I, was that this class I had that story? Yeah, I have two classes right now, so it's hard. I can remember if I told the story in the last seven weeks, I just can't remember which group of students I told it to. <laughs> All right, so feed speed, depth of cut, those are the, the critical parameters. They control the physics of the operation. Does that, make, does that make sense to everybody? But all the other things that we do, what day of the week it is, is a process variable. Um, did I tell you about Joe? The guy's name was actually Joe. Um, the company made golf club shafts. One of Joe's jobs, not the only thing he did, but one of the things that he did was after the shaft came out of its finishing process, he would hold it up to the light and say, yeah, that's a good one. He'd put it in the good one bin. Yep, that's a good one. Put it in the good one bin. Yeah, no, that one sucks. Put it in the reject bin or maybe the rework bin or wherever it was going. And so they did some statistical analysis on the process because they're trying to make their process better. And they found that every day after the Red Sox lost a game, the failure rate went through the roof because Joe was pissed off that the Red Sox had lost. So who's doing it, what day of the week it is, is a process variable. Um, uh, so, but in, in, as engineers, when you're, you're, you're gonna, especially if you're a manufacturing engineer, um, you're gonna spend a lot of time tr troubleshooting processes. You're gonna understand this process should make this part correctly. And, oh, it's even, it's even worse when sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. Because now you got to figure out what is the variable that I'm not accounting for. Check the check the ones first. Is it feed speed depth of cut? Make sure the clamping force is constant. You know you have enough clamping force. Make sure you don't have too much clamping force. Clamping too much switches the material, right? And who's had stress? Who's had the stress class here at WPI? What happens when I squish the material? It gets smaller. What happens if I keep squishing it? Because I'm really strong. I'm like built like the Hulk. It, it keeps getting, sometimes, so when I squish it and I let go, it gets smaller and then it gets back to the same size, right? Unless I squish it too hard, then I plastically deform it. And you can definitely plastically deform the material with the, we well, do it with the vice jaw, with that thing. Your, your part that got thrown out, the material was plastically deformed, right? That was why, was, did yours get thrown twice? Oh, there was, there was somebody where they put it back in. They saw the part's still okay. We put it back in. Then it had no chance because when it got levered out of the holder, this squished the side of it, right? It just, the, the material wasn't even there anymore to clamp on. So, um, so those are all different process variables. What's, all right, so let's, we've done our examples with turning. When we look at um, when we look at milling, when we look at milling operations. I already told you that the depth of cut has two components, right? There's an axial and a radial depth of cut. It's how far down in the material, how far over. We can all visualize that, right? So if you go 
down into the material, over into the material, that's two dimensions, right? That makes sort of a square. Then how fast you move through it, that's the feed. If you, if you know the square size and how fast you move through it, you actually know the volumetric material removal rate, right? If you, if, you, if you go through it for a certain amount of time, you can calculate exactly how much material did you remove. That makes sense. So it turns out that if you know the volumetric material removal rate, and you, could, you could do similar math for the turning operation, right? You need to know the thickness of the chip, the width of the chip, and the, the, the feed rate, right? Or the, the, the speed at that point, how fast it's going past. If you know the volumetric material removal rate, and you know some bulk properties of the material, you can actually estimate how much power it took to remove that much material, which is kind of cool. Because if you can estimate how much power it takes, what's power equal to? Current times voltage. Current times voltage. It is equal to that. We're going to measure power using that equation for sure. Work over time. What's work? Force over distance. So power. I'm going to put my feed back in this. Um, sorry. This one. I need. I need board number two. It's actually pretty cool. This is the first classroom I've had that really had good working up down boards. I'm kind of liking it. Board number two here. So this is the the this is the surface speed, right? That speed, and it's the surface speed, and it's the surface speed whether it's turning or milling. The surface speed comes from the rotation of the spindle. So on an end mill, the diameter you care about is usually the outside diameter of the end mill. Although if you're trying to plunge that end mill down into the workpiece material. You do care about the fact that the surface speed is zero at the center of the end mill. It cannot physically cut material at the center of the end mill. Physics say it can't happen. What it does do is it squishes, the, squishes that material out of the way. Because then I mentioned that we have thousands of pounds of thrust pushing down. It is cutting the material that's just adjacent to it, so it doesn't have to push it very far. Um, that's why we don't like to go plunging down with an end mill. Drills have a special tip on them to chisel that material out, and that's why we go down with drills, but you don't go sideways with drills. Um, just a, a thing. All right, this is, would anybody get too freaked out if I change the variable name from S to V? We could do that, we could do that conversion in our head. I lost my eraser though. I won't be able to do it. I like this room too, because I get some exercise. Sorry, V. I'm going to do an F also. So if we know the volumetric material removal rate and we know some bulk properties of the material, we can calculate power, power, which happens to equal force times velocity, where this is the velocity we're talking about, the surface speed velocity. So if we can estimate the power, then we can also estimate how much cutting force it's gonna to take to do the operation, which is actually pretty cool. Because if we can estimate how much cutting force it's gonna to take to do the operation, we can predict whether or not the tool is strong enough. If we know some properties of the tool, right? Is the tool gonna to break or not? Now, the other thing that's important here is we look at this is forces like pushing on something, right? Can I have a volunteer? Sure, come on up here, volunteer. Is it okay if I apply a force to you? I mean, I, I should ask for permission before I just start pushing people, right? Yeah. It's okay if I, okay, I have witnesses. Yeah. You said it's okay if I, all right. <laughs> so what happens when I push on him? He moves, right? He deflected, right? And so you can sit down. Thanks. First time I ever did that with a volunteer. Usually I'll usually I'll do it with a piece of chalk and then I'll deflect it until it breaks. 
I didn't didn't want to deflect him until he broke. But um, <laughs> so, if we can understand the force, the cutting forces that are going to happen, we can understand the deflection that's going to happen. So, what is who? Somebody that's had stress and strain. What's what's the deflection equation? Let's say uh, let's say we're doing our we're doing our turning operation. So we have a cantilevered beam. So we're supporting it here at the point where the chuck jaws are. So anybody know what the, the deflection equation is? Anybody Google it and look it up for me? So I could, we could predict how much it's going to deflect if we know the force, right? We have to know the force. What else do we have to know? Yeah. We have to know the length, how far away from the support we're applying that force. What else do we have to know? Yeah. The, yeah, so we actually have to know the area moment of inertia, I think, for the, yeah. for the part. The and, and that's dependent on the geometry. But for a round part, it's dependent on the radius. Right, and I, I think there's, there's there's a so there's a radius down here. It's it's in the eye. We're just gonna put eye. Like I think it is. Yeah. And what else do we have to know? Yeah, we have to know the last modulus of the material. And if we know this, we know how much it deflects when we apply the force. Except there's something missing, right? Yeah. The fourth power is in the I, um, and it's on the radius, but um, length is cubed. Length is to the third power. So the further away you are, the worse and worse it is to the to the third power. Um, so I always, it's, I always when I when I see people set up their tools. And they've got the whole tool out of the holder. They've got the whole damn tool sticking out of the holder. And they're barely holding on to it with anything or with your Y block. Right? We had the whole workpiece out of the vise. <laughs> so that deflection is even worse. And so who, who did Little League? What did the coach always say when he went to bat when you were little? Choke up on the bat, right? Choke up on the tool hold as little of the tool sticking out as possible so that it has the least chance of deflecting. Have as little of the workpiece unsupported as possible so that it has as little chance of deflecting. Because if it deflects too far, it breaks. Well, or if it's the vice thing, if it deflects too far, it just comes out, flies across the room, breaks the window. Um, it's only... I, for some reason, thought those windows were 700 bucks, but it was only like 200. So I don't know why I had 700 in mind. It must have been something else we broke recently that was 700. <laughs> oh, we've done $10,000. We've done $10,000 crashes before. I don't feel bad about that one. <laughs> um, all right. So length cube. Yeah, the length is cubed. Don't forget the length is cubed. Um, we, so we choose those things about how far out of the how far out we hold it. Right? That's that's a process variable. That's something we choose. Now there's constraints on it. We have to hold it out far enough to make the geometry, right? We have to hold the tool out far enough to make the geometry, but never stick the tool out further than it has to be. Sometimes it's really scary when you're using like an eighth inch diameter end mill, and for one thing, you don't cut very deep with those to start with. And so you're using the eighth inch diameter end mill, and there's only like three quarters of an inch of it sticking out below the end of the tool holder. And the tool holder is an inch and a half in diameter, maybe two inches in diameter. And the angle that you're looking at it from, because some of us are not this tall, right? The angle you're looking at it from, you can't see the end of the tool. And sometimes you do have to bend down and look at it, those things. So these are all process variables. These are things that we get to choose in order to determine whether or not the carbide is going to explode. So if you don't want to choose the wrong process variables, you get to choose these things. In fact, you have to choose them 
or use the default of whatever the last person did was, which usually is wrong. Even if they did it correct for what they were doing, it's usually not the same thing you were doing. Um, how do you pick the right feeds in depth of cut? Yeah. Simulate it. You could simulate it. We could do a bunch of math. We could estimate whether or not stuff's going to explode and blow up. But I think there's an easier method. <laughs> um, so let's let's use uh, different phrasing. Did everybody hear what he said? You can steal somebody else's work and copy. Plagiarism. <laughs> um, could we phrase it better? You could do research. <laughs> I could. In, in fact, I have I've spent parts of my life being a research scientist, so I totally can do that research. <laughs> there are. People have done the research. In fact, it's probably some of the most important research that has been done in, what century is this? So in the 20th century, it's probably some of the most important research that ever happened was understanding how to do, why do I say that, by the way? We did it. We did it mostly. I mean, the biggest leap forward in this research happened in the 1930s. <clears throat> it happened because we wanted to build airplanes and bombs and ships faster so we could go kill people. Oh my God. But, well, uh, that's why you build airplanes and bombs and ships. I mean, if they're Navy ships. Um, but um, so they did all this research to get better and faster at doing this machining stuff so that they could produce better but society benefits as a whole from the fact that the research happened so we know a lot about cutting a lot of different materials and they publish tables right so one place that you're going to go to look and there was there was talk years ago of making this be a required textbook for the class and then i realized that the library had it as an ebook that you could get access to for free and uh, decided that that was way better than making everybody go buy the 200 and something dollar book. Uh, but it is an excellent reference. Um, I have several editions of it in the hardcover, but it's the Machinery's Handbook. And so in the Machinery's Handbook, they have tables that can tell you what's, what's a good feed rate or spindle speed for this tool, for this type of tool in this type of material. But it really, all that research was done where we were using steel tools to cut things like steel and aluminum. So you get a really hard steel and you use that tool to cut the, uh, the material. We don't use any steel tools in the lab anymore except for drills. The drills we, still, we use with steel. We use um, ceramic tools now. And they're, they're made of silicon carbide typically. And so with the newer tooling, instead of going to the machinery's handbook to go look it up in a table, you go to the tooling manufacturer's website. Or you scan the QR code on the side of the box that brings you to the tooling manufacturer's website where they've tested that tool in different materials, in different configurations, and they'll give you a starting surface speed. They won't tell you an RPM because the surface speed is the same for that geometry type of tool regardless of the diameter. So you've got to figure out the RPM based on knowing the diameter you're using, or if it's a turning operation based on knowing the diameter of the workpiece. So they'll give you a surface speed, and it's, it's a starting, and they usually give you a range. Um, some of the emails we use, the range for surface speed in aluminum is six, zero to 6,000 surface feet per minute. So if I had a half inch end mill, the equation's still up here, right? If I had a half inch diameter end mill and I'm spinning at 6,000 surface feet per minute, what's my RPM need to be? Two times four, right? Because half, flip it over. So eight times 6,000. 48,000 RPM. So the fastest spindle that we have in the lab is uh, at either 12 or 15,000 RPM. 
So we can't spin it even up to its capacity at a half inch end mill. Um, and so in that case, we spin it as fast as we can. But if you're spinning it as fast as you can, just like the chuck jaws want to fly apart, well, the tool holder in the mill also wants to do stuff. We the, uh, the acceleration and deceleration curves on that the VM2, the one where you did the second operation of the Y block, I have seen it when you stop the spindle quickly, unscrew the nut on the end of the uh, tool holder. So we have different tool holders, and, and the ones that we use on that machine are rated for higher spindle speed, and those don't unscrew. And that's why we use a torque wrench to tighten them down on that machine also to make sure that they're tight enough they don't unscrew. Um, all right. The most important thing for you to remember from today, what is it? What's the most important thing I know? I am going to do a impromptu assignment and have it due at the end of the, should I let you think about it before the week starts. Impromptu assignment. The assignment will be to write a haiku about the most important takeaway from today's lecture. I think I know what was most important from today, but I wanna see what you all say was most important from today, about today. Uh, next week is the third full week of the term, is that true? Next week is the middle week of the term. Yeah. Oh, and thank the Lord, praise be to the Lord. There's no class on Wednesday, and we don't have to go to that crappy classroom on Wednesday. Praise be to the Lord. Um, but Monday and Thursday, Monday, Tuesday and Thursday are going to be important next week. And I'm going to try to, in Tuesday and Thursday, do the same content that I normally do in three days. I don't know if that's going to be um, effectual. I don't know if it's going to be possible. So it may spill into the following week. Uh, but it's where we're going to take all this stuff about how do we take what we know about the process variables? How do we calculate the different forces and the powers, understand that, and, and where do we go in the machinery's handbook to look this stuff up? Um, so next week is the mathiest part of the course. The, the mathiest part. The most mathy part of the class is next week. And we'll talk about making using um, spreadsheets to make computer models to simulate stuff and it'll be fun.